31,000, 45,000, the story of two trains of French resistance. A podcast by Mathieu Landour Engel. Robert Lambotte. 45,722. Guimauquet. Today is the 20th of May, 1942. Robert and 27 prisoners have been told they will be executed in a few hours. They don't know why. Some sabotage might have happened outside, and as hostages they will pay for whoever did whatever happened. Robert is confused. Scared, he's young. Only 20 years old. When you are 20, you wish for more than dying for something you didn't even commit. Two years earlier, Robert was 18 and living with his parents. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do in life, yet he did enjoy traveling. But there was a much more pressing matter to him than a career. There was war. France had lost the war, sure, but Robert didn't fight, he didn't feel like he lost, he didn't want Germany to rule him. No one could be seriously thinking that the new French government, Vichy, was a real thing. It wasn't. The French government was Nazi Germany wearing a fancy jacket, nothing more. With a couple of friends, Robert started his own resistance. The Communist Party was forbidden, yet it was looking to create small groups to either inform, protect or attack. Robert and some of his friends didn't have any experience for the latter, yet they were ready to help in any way. They were instructed to inform, to retrieve leaflets and newspapers, and distribute them in the neighborhoods. Robert and his friends felt useful. They were the early resistance. But it didn't last long. Robert was arrested on the 14th of September, 1940. The police came to his place. His parents opened the door. He didn't even have any time to explain them anything. There was a trial, and Robert expected to be guilty. He expected to be given around four to six months in prison. But he didn't expect to stay in jail after the expiration of his condemnation. It even became a joke amongst his friends. When are you getting out? Seven months ago. On the 27th of January 1941, Robert was transferred to another prison in Clairvaux. He met briefly a young man, even younger than him. They talked a little. His name was Guy Moquet. And he was arrested for the same reasons Robert did, distributing leaflets. Guy was even younger than Robert. He was a 16-year-old hostage. Yet he had the spirit of a leader, motivating others to demand better conditions, better food, He pushed everyone to hit their tins on the walls to make as much noise as possible until their demands were met, and once more with more demands. A darn good writer, Robert heard he was a poet too. Impressive young man. Back to the present, a year later, in May 1942. Robert has a couple of hours maximum before his execution. He has a lot to think about. He looks around him. There are so many young people. Guy Moquet was the youngest he had met, but Guy wasn't there. He was already gone, executed on the 22nd of October 1941, as a hostage to avenge the death of some German lieutenant. At 17, he was executed for something he had nothing to do with, because he was a communist, because his father and mother were communist representatives. Even from prison, Guy Moquet's death was a national tragedy. Everyone was shocked. Whoever decided on the execution of a 17 years old, the Germans, the French government, whoever did this went one step too far. Rather than scaring the population, it even became another reason to enroll into the resistance. But now it was Robert's turn, and Robert did not want to be afraid anymore. As all 27 condemned jump into a truck, they start singing the national anthem, the Marseillaise. The prisoners don't care anymore, they might as well sing. As all 27 condemned jumped into a truck, they start singing the national anthem, the Marseillaise. The prisoners don't care anymore, they might as well sing. And as they sing, they start hearing the other inmates from the prison they are leaving, singing in their honor. They are being celebrated for their courage, until the French soldier driving the truck orders them to shut the hell up. 
They are not on their way to be executed. Someone lied to them. They are being transferred to another place, to Royal Yue in Compiègne. It's a German camp. They are handed over to the German authorities. They are to become hostages. The idea is simple. Robert will stay there. And when another sabotage happens, an unresolved event, Robert or others will take responsibility. Hostages of a crime to come. This is who Robert will become. Yet their time hasn't come yet. This is not Robert Tandy. Thank you for listening to this episode of 31,000-45,000. My name is Mathieu Landorengel and I am developing this project on my personal funding. This episode was about Robert Lambotte, who lived in Paris. The Communist Party was forbidden in France, yet it still existed in a more clandestine manner. The French population was quite shocked at first about losing the war, quite pessimistic about the future. The Vichy regime, the French government, managed to keep, to retain a facade of sovereignty, but with German troops walking on the streets of the cities, it became quite clear for everyone that well, the French country was occupied. Now, most of the French population accepted the situation. They were not happy about it, but it was accepted at first by most. It's important to realize that resistance in France was the decision of the few, not the most. It was said that around 2% of the population actively resisted. And in 1940, that number was even lower. The French youth was very much active in the resistance, yet at first obviously lacked experience. The early acts of resistance were information related and it was mostly about informing the population, printing the information, transporting it, spreading it through tracks or leaflets. This was the resistance of young men like Robert Lambotte. Now Guy Moquet is an important figure in the French resistance, a symbol even. His father was Prosper Moquet, a communist deputy. Guy was part of the communist youth, and his activism grew stronger as his father was arrested by the French authorities on the 8th of October 1939, in the same time as Robert Philippot, whom I talked about in a previous episode. Prosper Moquet was deported to a camp in Algeria. Guy Moquet wrote several letters to the government as he wished for his father to be freed. At the same time, he participated to the clandestine distribution of leaflets and was arrested under denunciation. Guy Moquet admitted to nothing, he was actually a quit. Yet, just like Robert Lambotte, he became a hostage. On the 20th of October 1941, a commander was shot by communist resistance and it was decided that 50 hostages would be shot immediately. The list of the 50 hostages was made by the French government who decided to put most communist and syndicated men. As for Guy Moquet, he was not on that list but was added by the German administration as it was thought that murdering a 17-year-old man would be a good example, a good deterrent. Guy Moquet wrote a very well-known letter before his execution, addressed to his family and friends. His death marked a turning point in France under the occupation. It was a massive warning of what it meant to live in a country occupied by Germany. Rather than a threat, it was another reason to join the resistance. Nowadays, Guy Moquet is a well-known figure in France. The hostage policy is a new step in persecution by the German authorities. After the armed action of Pierre Georges on the 22nd of August 1941, where a German officer was killed in public inside the Barbès Rochoir subway station, a decision was made to consider hostages. So lists were given, willingly at first until unwillingly, by the French authorities to the German. So hostages were selected, mostly communists, and if another attack was to happen and no guilty people found, then hostages would be shot. Many hostages were shot until another decision was made to deport hostages. I will come back to hostages deportation in the next chapters, as I will come back to Pierre Georges, the future Colonel Fabien. I don't know precisely how much Robert Lambot and Guy Moquet knew each other. I only know they could have met, as they were both prisoners in the same prison. It is probable that they talked to one another. They were both young. It's not unlikely, but I have no way of proving this. I made many other assumptions in this story. I don't know whether Robert admired Guy Moquet, whether he wished to be brave before dying, whether he sang. 
I took some liberties regarding those elements. Clairvaux, the place where Guimauquet and Rambert Lambot were, was an abbey converted as a prison back in uh, 1804. It was a dreadful place, apparently, according to the French Wikipedia page. I mentioned another camp, the Vauve camp, near Chartres, southwest of Paris, actually close to my hometown. At first, the camp was for French soldiers. It then became a political prisoner camp. My sources for this story are the website Mémoire Vive, the book Red Triangles in Auschwitz by Claudine cardon amé and Wikipedia. I have been trying to find Robert Lambot's relatives, unfortunately. My research was unsuccessful. If by any chance you know of someone related to Robert Lambot, please let me know. I would be very pleased to get in touch and make sure the text I wrote doesn't contain any errors. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Next episode will be about Ronald Lefebvre, a father and son relationship and an extraordinary canoe travel from France to the United Kingdom. Thirty one thousand forty five thousand The story of two trains of French resistance. A podcast by Mathieu Landour Engel.